Good morning, colleagues. Um, for those of you whom I have not met yet, my name is Maxi Suskman. I'm from the Department of Political Sciences here at the University of Pretoria. And it is my privilege this morning to welcome all of you here at this Mercury conference. This is the conference that will see the conclusion to a three-year project. Mark Aspinwell, my colleague from Edinburgh, will say a bit more about that in a moment. It's been a real privilege and a joy to be, to be able to, to lead this group, Mercury, uh, through the three years that we've worked together. And I also want to make a, a few a brief words of thanks, first of all, to Maxi and to, to uh, Lorenzo for having organized this conference and the, the others, friends and colleagues in Pretoria who've worked so hard to bring us all together. This is really important for us in the EU, in Europe, in North America, and elsewhere to get out of the so-called North and come and have a conversation with others uh, around the world. And it's been important to have Pretoria and Fudan University from Shanghai within our project for precisely that reason. Um, it's been a really impressive project uh, over the three years, and I'm going to talk you through it just a little bit. This is one of our road shows, as it were, Mercury on the Road. We don't quite have the t-shirts printed, but uh, we have been in various different places, mostly within the EU, um, to, to talk about our, our results. Okay, um, we are a group of nine universities altogether, uh, including these listed at the top, uh, and advised by a high-profile set of advisory board members, including Lionel Barber at the top, who's just been writing about his uh, trip in West, West Africa, Nigeria, and Ghana. He's been uh, doing some reporting from there. The editor. That's who we are. Uh, what we've done, um, we've done research on the EU and the external relations of the EU. Let me say a bit more about that in a moment. Research is only one part of uh, the Mercury project, and it's only one part of any project funded by the European Commission uh, nowadays. There are several other elements, in my view, at least as important as the actual research that we turn out. One is uh, outreach and communication, of which this set of meetings here in Pretoria is a, an integral part. We're also a networking uh, organization. Um, that's among institutions. This is institutional networking, bringing together the nine partners has been part of that. So we do academic work, and we also do policy-related work. We make ourselves available to media, to government, to schools. Um, our challenges on outreach, because these are, these are some of the most, um, the toughest things for us to grapple with as an organization, and based primarily around academics and run by academics, we're not always as skilled as others in developing a strategy for outreach and for dissemination. Okay, on that note, uh, I won't say any more about the intellectual content because we're going to be drawing that out through the course of the next few, um, few hours and the next day and a half or so. Um, again, thank you all very much for coming. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and comments and listening to the panelists. Thanks. Um, so the growing voice uh, of civil society in multilateralism uh, can no more be ignored, and uh, it has become something that it's always taking note of. Uh, in an attempt by states uh, to grapple with some of the challenges that we're faced with today. Uh, if we have to look at the African perspective of multilateralism, we cannot but escape uh, some of the history of the integration of the African continent into modern systems of governance, uh, which dates back to colonialism, post-colonial uh, period, the Cold War itself, uh, the post-Cold War period. The institutions that the African continent established itself, starting from the organization of African unity in 1963, and the African Union. That in itself uh, indicates uh, some of the issues and how the continent itself has used uh, multilateralism within the continent and outside of the continent in order to promote and defend its own interests. Uh, and, and all we are saying uh, is that when it comes to peace and security matters uh, that impact upon the African continent, it is important 
that the African voice is listened to, we can be able to make a contribution towards finding solutions. Uh, the coalition came and left. Libya remains in the continent. It's still close to the Mediterranean, but it has become our chief problem. But having said all those things and looking into uh, a different uh, uh, attempts to deal and mitigate against this, you should still believe that there is a benefit for Africa in getting more and more involved in the multilateral processes, including its own institutions. Africa is still the region that lags behind in several areas, from democracy to the indices of development. Thus, in their development, African states have benefited from the existence of multilateral norms, as mentioned above. The UN's continued pr propagation over the years of norms of human rights, democracy, and government governance has had a positive impact on Africa. Indeed, the UN and its various institutions and agencies are behind the efforts to support democracy, human rights, and good governance in various African countries. In 2000, and precisely year 2000, there was much hope that we had come to the beginning of a process where Europe and Africa can sit together and begin to look at different areas where we could forge cooperation and ensure that the relationship between the two continents and the experiences that we could have learned from the European Union uh, in the manner in which it is organized could take into consideration and admitting the fact that Africa has composed 54 countries all with their own uh, a distinct character, interest and history but at the same time bound together by a, a common desire to exist within a very hostile global environment. A part of the problems that we have had, and they continue to uh, reflect some of the challenges that we have indicated, even in the case of the United, United Nations, is that the partnership was, in the first place, based on equality. But that got eroded uh, very fast. At first, the understanding was that this was going to be a partnership between the EU and the AU, or the Organization of African Union at the time, the OAU. But because of other interests uh, and, and other problems that started to intervene, the character changed. We are now talking about Africa or Europe-Africa summit. Uh, the change of that character was not just a, a significant process, but it reflects some of the deep suspicions and divisions and, and, and attempts to hold on to control and, and, and to manage the African continent in a particular way. Uh, it was on the assistance of some of the European countries that EU as an institution should not engage the AU or the, Afri the Organization of African Unity as an institution. But we should have the EU engaging Africa as a continent. When I was thinking about the subject and, uh, and, uh, and listening to um, Ambassador Trapo, I couldn't help but make the first few general points. The first point is that multilateralism has always been a complex exercise, has always been a complex um, a, a platform uh, because getting a wide variety of sovereign states, sovereign on the line, to work together to design a system within which all of them can benefit um, uh, somehow was always going to be very difficult, especially if you believe realists who 
who, who, who underline the point that uh, states are in it in order to acquire their relative power in the system. And the number of multilateral platforms is also in, in, increasing in, in new ways, positive in the sense that it creates new spaces for finding meaning in the system, for, 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 uh, for re-oiling the system, for, for finding points of convergence, uh, uh, for finding um, uh, 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 ingredients for consensus where we had come to know the UN as the primary institution in multilateralism, it is, it is increasingly being marginalized, uh, being tested, uh, being uh, questioned by the rise of more agile uh, platforms that can take decisions much more quickly and, and that may have a greater bearing on the solutions for transnational challenges than the UN is. Um, good morning. This is my first time in South Africa and I come very much as a Europeanist. So rather than trying to cover all of the points of multilateralism in 10 minutes, I'm going to focus very much on the Ambassador's points about EU-Africa relations and think about multilateralism in that context. But in particular, to think a bit about what entities are we talking about? As the ambassador pointed out, Africa is a continent of 54 countries, but the European Union isn't a single entity either. We have 27 member states, and despite over 50 years of integration, we still have our own interests. So talking about EU Africa isn't just talking about two entities. We're talking about many sovereign nations. So the perspectives are quite difficult, and we can't simply say, the EU has a particular position and a particular stance. The question is, how far do you get with diplomacy? How far do you get with negotiation? And what other tools does the European Union have? Yes, we can negotiate. Yes, in terms of the WTO, Europe speaks with one voice. And in that context, the European dimension can be very strong. Yes, we're a very significant trading bloc. But in terms of foreign policy, Europe still relies very much on two of the larger member states, the UK and France. So a set of, I suppose, questions back, how best can we listen to you? How best can Europeans hear the voice of Africans and work with you in order that we create the sort of stability that we've created within our own continent? That if the European Union had aims and values in the 1950s. It was about peace, security and prosperity in our own continent. If we've sought to export values, it's again about peace, security, prosperity, but also about liberal democracy. And while we haven't sought, as the European Union, to impose democracy in other countries, it's clearly something where there is an ambition that states become democratic where possible. Should we be negotiating with the African Union to try and bring that about? Should we mind our own business and only engage if there is a potential crisis? How best can we work with you? What lessons should we be taking back to Europe? So, a set of questions rather than um, a series of formulated statements, which I hope will stimulate for the discussion. Thank you. I still have a problem to understand precisely the theoretical meaning of multilateralism. Uh, I will speak about it the way we see it in Africa, more a case study sort of thing. So if I'm wrong, Professor Smith, you can tell me afterwards. This Africa as one uh, entity. But both Africa and the European Union, of course, regards multilateralism as an instrument of diplomatic preference. It's a best practice to overcome the deficiencies uh, of state actors and to promote the global agenda and self-interest. One must be honest and frank and say that it is a very asymmetrical relationship, given, given what Europe is, given what Africa is.
I mean, it's, it's, it's clear from the discussions that we've had uh, just now, uh, the presentation that, that we've had just now and the discussions we've, we've had earlier that uh, there, there is a need to, to rethink multilateralism uh, precisely because there are differing understandings of, or different understandings of what this concept means. And uh, the very genesis of this con concept uh, Arose, began, or the genesis of this con concept was in a in a context that is different from uh, the uh, the context we have uh, today. That is uh, characterized by the rise of emerging emerging powers, um, the decline of the leadership of, of, the, of the U.S. and, uh, and the EU uh, on managing global affairs, uh, and the new spaces that are opening up for countries that were not at the center of uh, making decisions on a range of global issues um, now able to, to, to do so. The, I think my starting point would be that uh, multilateralism as an idea, as a doctrine, remains very attractive um, as, you know, uh, and, and because it helps to, to manage a Tabulan world system and its associated risks. It, it helps to foster interdependence and greater cooperation. And certainly, it does help to discipline the use of, uh, of might, of, 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 uh, of, of power over, over rule. Uh, and by implication, uh, it, uh, it asserts the need for a rules based framework uh, to, uh, to, to manage. Um, trade to manage uh, finance and, uh, and economics as well as uh, more recently issues related to environment and, and climate change. If we are to think of uh, a better framework for multilateral cooperation or for multi multi multilateralism, uh, we, we have to give consideration to the importance of trust, um, confidence building in, in the system because they, you know, they are signs of fragmentation, of mistrust. Uh, the, the EU no longer has as much weight as it did way back then, back then in Africa as a result of uh, the rise of, of new powers. Uh, there are various you know, exclusive multi multilateralisms taking place. The G8 continues to, to exist as a lobby group for, for powerful countries um, and that raises very important questions about how do we create bridges across all these uh, uh, different uh, fragmented initiatives. And, and, and of course, uh, 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 finally, <clears throat> really balancing pragmatism uh, slash interests and what we talk about loosely as, as norms. Because it's very nice to talk about norms, but uh, you know, are we serious in, in, in talking about norms in, in a pure <coughs> sense? Because countries continue to have uh, to, to have national interests, um, they need to have efficiency in decision making, which is to mean uh, pushing, pursuing, and pushing for for their interests to be, uh, you know, the, the dominant interests uh, that, that are outcomes of decision making processes. Thanks. I want to make three points. One is to to suggest that the foundation on which the current re regime of multilateralism was based is no longer sustainable, but that there is no um, alternative sustainable basis at the moment. And secondly, that the issues that we want multilateralism in global economic governance to deal with um, have changed dramatically from what they were when the original or the current order was set up, um, but the, we don't have a feasible basis for dealing with those issues at the moment. And then not to leave you totally depressed, to, to make some suggestions on ways in which we can try and deal with this interregnum that we're in at the moment. What, 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 how do we adjust to this situation which could last for a long time? I would say the most important thing is we have to be very careful and very um, hard-nosed in acknowledging what the limitations on the capacity for reform in the system are at the moment. They're not very great but that the only way we can move forward is by learning how to exploit the small changes that do exist. And you can do that both structurally and um, substantively. Structurally, I think it means much more focus for us in South Africa on South-South cooperation. 
um, both at a regional level and with organizations like BRICS. <coughs> it also means forming tactical alliances with progressive elements in international civil society and with other states in other parts of the world. Substantively, it means learning a lesson from Bill Clinton, the president, which was that you felt when you can't win the big issues, you try win the small issues that open up spaces for, for the future change. And there are some that we can use in the short run. So the first is institutional reforms of the IFIs to make them more accountable. Um, a focus on the Financial Stability Board, which is of growing significance in the ma management of the global financial system. Um, it means working on the G20 to make sure that it's more accountable and more responsive to our needs, to African needs. Um, it, and identifying the issues that allow us to actually win victories and demonstrate uh, change. And in, in that sense, even though we lost in the battle for the president of the, the World Bank, which at the end of the day was just a symbolic issue anyhow, is the fact that Africa was united and Africa led the campaign and Africa showed that there are African candidates who are the most credible candidates um, for the job is a big victory in terms of organizing Africa as a continent. Um, so there are opportunities. I think if we went through trade and other issues, we could find more of them. But I think that's, that's a job for researchers rather than for this discussion. Andy, so thank you very much. In 1945, when the UN was um, established, it was considered the zenith of multilateralism. It was a triumph for multilateralism. And as the apex of this body, the Security Council became the apex of multilateralism, in theory. But what followed was exactly the opposite. It became, um, in all respects, a failure of multilateralism. And Surely we can blame the Cold War for the posturing, for the deadlocks, etc., etc. So the Security Council very much became um, a victim of changes in international relations. Now, and in the process, obviously, um, the debate about reform of this entity became more and more pronounced, especially after the end of the Cold War, when the space was opened up for countries such as a rehabilitated Germany and, and um, Japan, I'm saying rehabilitated because the Security Council reflected the victor nations of the Second World War, for them to finally stand up and take their place and say we are major contributors to the budget of the United Nations and yet we don't feature on the Security Council. The Security Council, whether it likes it or not, is being reformed by multilateralism. And that is not just a matter of the identities of the permanent core. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, well, what I want to talk about is the NATO EU member state triangle. Uh, no Africa in there, right? Uh, I will mention Chad once. Uh, I will start with the NATO and the EU because I think that on this triangle uh, you can kind of show the problems of the multilateral cooperation and the ideal of the multilateral uh, global governance uh, might actually face. Uh, if we take NATO and the EU as a couple, uh, for a long time, or NATO and the European community, for a long time there was no serious problem between the two, uh, because simply they coexisted and they completely uh, lacked any area where they would touch upon each other. Uh, NATO dealt with the defense of Europe, uh, European community dealt with the economic cooperation and integration outside of the defense area. And the EU, as the newcomer into the security business, needs NATO to help. Uh, now, the interesting thing is that nowadays you can hear talks about something called Berlin plus re reversed, uh, which would actually mean EU helping NATO uh, in areas where NATO needs to move but, but doesn't have the capability. Uh, so apparently there is a huge area uh, where the two organizations overlap. Uh, so you have parallel processes both in NATO and the EU, but apparently none of these processes leads anywhere. Uh, so you end up with, uh, and I'm now mentioning the Africa part in my presentation, uh, so you come up with the operation in charge and the EU decides that it, 
wants to go there, uh, but it takes a, a year, a whole year, uh, before it actually finds the capabilities to do it, uh, although the consensus is there. Uh, because you have this room to maneuver for the states that do not want to deliver and simply do not deliver. I think that the example of the EU-NATO relationship actually shows that this missing strategic dialogue between the two uh, leaves too much room for free riders, and I guess you would find that between and among all the organizations that you look at, uh, and complicates the cooperation which otherwise uh, would have been clearly the only option. I've been very fortunate to lead um, our negotiations on a particular aspect of the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is technically called 1B6 of the Bali Action Plan, uh, but essentially deals with the social and economic consequences of response measures, or in other words, trade and climate change from the perspective of developing countries. Uh, when one looks at the intersection of trade and climate change, uh, which I'd like to share some insider perspective on how multilateralism works, it really lies at the intersection of two of the most contested regimes, which is the WTO on the one hand and uh, the UNFCCC on the other. And I think while multilateralism to some extent has delivered in terms of the climate change negotiations, and we recently had COP17 in Durban, um, I think when one looks at uh, the outcomes of Durban, the fact that the Americans were so upbeat about the outcomes means that we as developing countries did something wrong. <laughs> but to some extent there has been a delivery there. But in the WTO, um, you know, as Nzukisi said earlier, it's over a decade long in terms of the world's lo longest running trade round. To some extent, the United States is the biggest stumbling block. Um, the European Union, to a large degree, doesn't matter much more in the Doha round. And the emerging economies have really come of age. Um, you know, we've sat, it's, it's been quite a struggle to try to come to some kind of agreement around trade and climate change in the UNFCCC. Uh, we traveled to two distant meetings in Bonn and Panama City at great expense. Uh, we met our partners from the north and we sat across the table from them, very good friends. Paul Watkinson, who leads the EU, is actually French, not English, and uh, his colleague Dr. Delano Fauve, a uh, Dutch national from Suriname. And we try to negotiate around this, but there just is very different perspectives on how we deal with trade and climate change. The EU has a very strong trade interest in uh, this, this element of the debate. They would like to see trade and climate change dealt with in the WTO, where there are um, where the rules are not so clear uh, around what is possible and what is not, and it's open to abuse. Developing countries are saying they would like to discuss this in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. First and foremost, it's climate measures you're taking that have an impact on trade and production. Um, so we, we don't really have much clarity there. But what we have agreed on, and which was a victory for developing countries, was the establishment of a forum on response measures, which is an institutional mechanism through which um, developed and developing country parties can actually sit around the table and share their experiences of uh, the impact of an emissions trading scheme in aviation on South African tourism or the exports of flowers and green beans from Kenya. Um, how does one measure embodied carbon? What kind of methodologies can one use? So we're very much a, a very open and frank exchange on the impact of climate change on trade. It hasn't gone down well with our European partners. They don't want to discuss this at all. They're looking for cover for the kinds of protectionist policies they'll be introducing in the future. Um, so to a large extent, um, the outcome of COP17 was very much a victory for us. We got the establishment of this forum on response measures, um, which, uh, we, which took a lot, of, uh, you know, a, a lot of resources and fighting to actually get to that end. Um, I think the challenge now going forward is for us and our partners in, in the North to actually work to make this forum uh, a, a useful mechanism which we can actually understand and explore better these linkages between trade and climate change. Once those are better understood, we can then move towards the, the rules, um, uh, the development of rules which impact on this area. So um, that's where we are now.